Welcome to the show. Me and my shiny forehead coming to you from <laughs> Greenville, South Carolina. <laughs> That's great. Jesse and his hat in Cleveland and Vince and his backdrop in Granger. How's everybody doing today? It's Friday, so that's uh, first and foremost the most important part of of the day. Today was the uh, busiest day I've ever had at my other job. Really? So yeah, um, I was pretty for, busy today too for Friday. <laughs> for all the wrong reasons, that's for sure. So yeah, but it, hey, it's the weekend now officially. So I have been looking forward to this show all day. So I'm excited. Good. We were just Jesse and I were sitting in here waiting for you to to log in before we started the show. And I said, you know, I think it's notable that uh, Vince didn't respond to any of the group texts <laughs> during the day. So yeah. I was getting a, I was getting a little bit worried about things uh, getting started, you know, with uh, with the trio instead of just the duo. And then. In the <laughs> so. <laughs> well, and then I was late getting on and it was a whole thing today. Uh, I literally just walked in the door. So like, that's how. So my day went, but again, yeah. yes, it was one of one of the uh, one of those days today. But hey, it's all good. I got a drink. I got my boys. I'm ready. All right. Well, we've got a lot to get to today, and yeah, we do. Uh, you know, we had uh, some some like heavy stuff kind of dropped on us yesterday afternoon that we had to save for today because I was traveling and we didn't have a show yesterday. <laughs> so we will just get right to it. By now, I think that. You know, most people have at least heard about Notre Dame President John Jenkins and Athletic Director Jack Swarbrick's op-ed in the New York Times. And as you can imagine, there's a lot to it. Um, it is directed at NIL, but there's a lot of other stuff that is in there as well. Among the things that they want from the NCAA and or Congress, whichever you know route ends up needing to be taken. They want strict NIL rules. They want a national policy for schools, student athletes on missed class time, you know, class time that you miss for traveling to games and such and playing in games and that kind of thing. They want the NFL to create its own minor league system. They want the NBA to eliminate one and done. Uh, they don't want athletes to be treated as employees. They basically want everyone to put a higher value on the educational aspect of being a student athlete and I'll I'll be honest I've never been fond of the term student athlete because we only talk about them because they're athletes I get that they're in school and since NIL I have been even less fond of that term and maybe that's kind of what they're talking about so guys I will just throw it out there what do you think about this uh this op-ed that they wrote there's just a lot of layers to it, first and foremost. Like, absolutely. It's, it, there's just a lot said, and there's it, it's not the, like these opinions are are very well thought out, first of all. And I I like that Schwarbrick is voicing his opinion in this manner. Um, but overall, like you said, you know, ninety nine. Like, I'm just gonna kind of go through some of some of the things that I found significant about the article. Um, you know, eco, he said that that economic economists estimate that a college Economist? degree is <laughs> wow <worth. laughs> master's Economist. degree yes. yes my head hurts today <laughs> <laughs> they, so i now i'm stumbling over it they estimate that a degree is typically worth about one million dollars in enhanced earning power over a lifetime and i think that's the main point that schwerberg was getting at is that academics need to be valued over nil and that the NIL shouldn't just turn into a, a funneling of money from third parties, basically claiming that it's coming from, you know, for image and likeness that, you know, he doesn't disagree with what the NIL is. It's just that the way that it's it's already being abused and the way that it takes away the value um, of education. And really, that's the whole underlying kind of concept of the article is to me is that everything is taking away from the most important part of college. And that is getting a degree and, you know, finishing your degree in right. some way. And I think that's what led, you know, what led to his other, you know, opinions of get rid of the one and done, because why even come to college for one year if your intent is to go straight to the NBA, just oh. you know, eliminate the one year and allow them to go straight to the NBA if that's going to be your choice. Um, and then the, the addition of minor league, you know, football basically saying, OK, there needs to be some sort of, you know, 
pay outside of college before you get to the NFL. So guys aren't so worried about, you know, making as much money as possible from the NIL in college. So I don't necessarily agree with establishing an, a minor league NFL system. I don't think that that uh, is the move. And I think that you can, te- you know, you could basically say that these new leagues, XFL, um, you know, the, I can't think of the USFL, other, USFL, those are kind of what are becoming minor league, you know, football leagues, and they just haven't been panning out. So again, to me, the article was just placing the stress on how much academics matter and the things that are taking away from academics right now. I actually love this article, uh, if I'm being honest, and I will admit that I read it for the first time about 20 minutes ago. And, you know, everything, all the points that it hit, though, were points that I've always thought were important right now. They had different ways of kind of going about and achieving the goals that they think need to be a part of college athletics. And they're basically saying, look, if you don't want to be a part of the college atmosphere, you don't want to be a student, then don't go to college. But there has to be another avenue for those guys. So that's why they were saying, okay, the they need to have a, a minor league for the NFL and they need to get rid of the one and done because they're saying, look, don't force these kids to go to college. That way you can still have student athlete and 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 the education piece is still important. I get it. I didn't really think about going that direction for it, but I but I do get it, right? Because and, and I've always said this, and anybody with student loans who has a college degree is also going to agree with this because everybody says, you know, these guys should be paid all this money. Da, 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 da. Well, the degree that they're getting for free is a form of payment. I mean, that is a form of payment. If I worked at the University of Notre Dame and my kid got to go to school there for free, for example, that's huge. That is money that is going to remain in my pocket that didn't need to go to the school. Like that's awesome. That's a that's a huge benefit. And everybody seems to overlook that. That a scholarship does equal a free education. That's a lot of money depending on where you go. If you go to Notre Dame, that's a ton of money, right? So that's a that's a piece that I think people forget about. And I also and I think everybody can agree that there needs to be rules when it comes to NIL cuz right now it's the wild wild west and it's I mean, ridiculous. Of of this whole thing, that's what I agree with the most. Does there need do there need to be rules that that govern NIL? Of course they do. But you know like Jack Swarbrick and Father Jenkins are very smart men. And this was obviously a very strategic move on their part. Totally calculated, yes. Yeah, because on the same day that this op-ed comes out in the New York Times, Swarbrick is on the College Football Inquirer podcast with Pat Forty, Dan Wetzel, and Ross Dellinger explaining his rationale on all the points of this piece. So they obviously got a preview of this and were able to see it before it was even published, you know, because it's a pre-recorded podcast that came out yesterday it's not live necessarily like ours not surprisingly as vince just displayed the response is polarizing you know because just like notre dame itself is polarizing if you're with notre dame you're going yeah great points you know something's got to be done about all this and if you're anti notre dame you're rolling your eyes and you're like yeah of course you know and there's also some misguided responses of course that predictably come along with this because it's notre dame you know, you know, like it, 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 it took all of, you know, 30 seconds for the, well, this is because Notre Dame being in a conference is eminent. They know they've got to be in a conference. I'm sorry, guys. One plus one <laughs> does not equal three. You know, it has nothing right. to do with what they're talking about right now. The general sentiment I agree with, especially the NIL part that you guys talked about. And I'm sure that Swarbrick and Jenkins think that, but you know, like they're the first through the wall. They'll get a little bit bloody on all this. They hope that they get some support from some other people, you know, so that they're not just like the lone wolves howling into the wind on this whole thing. But, you know, again, I agree there needs to be better NIL oversight. And they think schools should be required to report NIL transactions. And then they have to actually prove that some service was performed in order for the players to you know get the nil payment and i'm down with that as well the right. problem with convincing you know anyone to side with them is everyone knows notre dame has the money for nil they just don't want to spend it 
you know? Mm -hmm. So like, if I'm going to play devil's advocate in all this, it's like, they just don't want to spend the money is what this comes down to. And, you know, they, they want to keep their high ground on this. They had the second highest ticket prices in college football last year, according to a, a report that came out about a month ago. They obviously have their own TV contract. They have an endowment of nearly $20 billion with a B. The, the school reported more than $215 million in athletic department revenue last year. And they're acting like, you know, well, if things don't change, we might have to cut some Olympic sports and all this. You know, that was part of the article as well. And, you know, again, I get Swarbrick as a Notre Dame alum who's proud of being a Notre Dame alum and what it stands for and all that. But with the academic standards that they're talking about, you know, that's your standard. And just because it's your standard doesn't mean that everyone else is going to value it the way that you do. And they want, you know, I'm not saying that as a pejorative. I'm just saying it pragmatically. You know, Vince, you'll remember this. A few years back, remember Digger Phelps convinced the South Bend School Corporation to implement higher God. academic standards? Yes, I do. Yeah, and they were above what the rest of the state had to be right. for a for an athlete to be eligible to play sports. I had a kid when I was coaching baseball, would have been my best pitcher, who mm -hmm. was declared yeah. ineligible for the you know entire baseball season. But if he had gone to Penn, if he had gone to Elkhart, you know, the Catholic schools, wherever, anywhere else in the state, he would have been academically eligible. But because he was in the South Bend School Corporation, was so he wasn't. Stupid. Yeah, and then, you know, and, and then guess what? Guess what happened? As, as, again, you well know. You know, for one, you know, nobody cared that our kids had the higher academic standard nope. to make. It's like, nobody, nobody cares about that. You got to go out and play. And then a few years later, South Bend went back to the state standards and you've got everybody else. The headline was South Bend Community School Corporation <laughs> lowers academic standards. Right. And right. so everyone starts slamming them because they're saying, well, see, the school corporation sucks so much. Now they're lowering their academic standards. Well, they're lowering them back to what everyone else yeah. has. You know, oh, but yeah. my point is, it's great if you have your own personal standards. And Notre Dame obviously has its own personal standards. But that doesn't mean everyone else is going to buy into it, has to buy into it. And that's essentially what they want. This is 2023. It's not 1923 when Newt Rockney was coaching and, you know, college sports actually were somewhat pure. And, you know, so I just, I just see all this ultimately falling on deaf ears. So I, I understand what you're saying. And I agree that Notre Dame has the money to, to kind of keep up as long as they do it within the standards of, you know, you earn, earn it for, you know, your name image um, and likeness. But again, for me, it just feels like the main point of this article is to eliminate the, the term of, basically athlete only it, it, these guys shouldn't be coming to school athlete only and getting paid for it because they just want the money and that's where the proposal of the minor league system comes up because okay if you don't want to you know be a student athlete and you just want to get paid then go semi-pro and then go professional um after that so i understand what you're saying of not wanting to to shell out the money but to, again to me that what it feels like the main point is is there, there, there should be guys that guys shouldn't be coming to college just to play sports and then leave and not worry about their right. academics or let you know, their again, academics suffer. Like the one and done thing. And there has been talk recently that the NBA could be doing away with that. But again, like their Notre Dame is saying that because why one and done handicaps Notre Dame because they're not willing to go in on those kind of guys. Like that's just the bottom line, you know, Duke, another you know, very highly thought of academic institution, they've gone all in on it because basketball is their moneymaker. They don't have, you know, football is not a moneymaker like football is at Notre Dame. So they've been willing to commit to, to one and done type guys. But Notre Dame is not going to go there because they want to keep their academic standing. And, you know, so again, it's like that's Notre Dame standard, but they, again, they want to apply that to everybody else. No, no, you're you're absolutely wrong. Just, just one ND gal, Blake 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 Wesley was one and done. Nobody knew that from the jump. Vince, help me out with this. Well, nobody, nobody, Notre Dame didn't maybe, know it. Maybe from an academic. Yeah, that's standpoint. the issue. But because yeah, but like yeah. that was that was covered. That was as you said yeah. basically earlier in the week. That was covered up. You know when he was yeah. still in high school. It was covered up very whatever, well. Whatever his transcripts look like, but from a talent yes. standpoint. 
Blake Leslie was not supposed right. to be a one and done. No, and he wasn't going to be. And he wouldn't have been talking a talking talent, guys. Correct, and he wouldn't have been a one and done from a talent standpoint. Anyway, he left because of the academic piece, not because he was actually ready to go to the NBA. Now he's doing a when he's not injured, he's doing a, a good job, and it it's like acid out of my mouth, but it's still he's doing a good job from what I can what from what I can gather, and so that's great for him. But he, there was never the plan for him to be a one and done. It, it, right. They wanted him to stick around and, Even and the in whole the thing. Summer, in yeah. the summer, before his freshman year, when he first got on campus and we, we got the media got to go over and watch the workout, it was just like, okay, you know, he yeah. looks like everybody else taking jumpers. And Bray is talking after practice like, yeah, we want him to focus on defense and, and those right. kind of things. There was no thought that Blake no. Wesley was going to have the kind of season that he had it was never the plan None. it was never the plan so yeah that's and and that's and look and and you know Notre Dame can put out their high and mighty you know this that and the other and that's fine I mean that's great I mean I am a Notre Dame fan because of the values that Notre Dame holds from that standpoint and that's great but again like you said they can't push that on everybody else and I'm fine with that too because my my big issue though is the NIL piece. Right. And that's that's my know, biggest part that's, of this whole that's thing. Definitely the headline out of this whole thing as well is the NIL piece. And that's right. the part of what they're saying right. that I 100 percent agree with. I, because I said before NIL was ever instituted, when they were still talking about it, how are you going to keep it from impacting right. recruiting? And that's the first abuse, you know, everyone started abusing it right oh. away. And, the blank know, check to the recruits is ridiculous. Yes, yeah, that's no, it is. It absolutely is. And I and I and I, again, I agree with what they're saying. Like, you you need to show, you know, you need to report what the transaction is, and you need right. to prove that yes. that some service was actually performed in order, you know, to right. to get that money. And that's that's not be, you know. I, I think that's a bare minimum. You know, even then, absolutely. you're going to have some people who find a way, their way around the system. You know, it's just like. You know, back in the in the days where they would let college guys go get summer jobs or whatever, and it's like they're supposed to be washing cars down at the car dealership or whatever, and they never show right. up for work. You know, they're just pocketing money. Right. You know, there's been abuses forever, as Swarbrick said, as well. But that's 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 what they got to get figured out. Like the absolutely. Last time, like when he started talking about, you know, like Miss Cla again. That's like Notre Dame has a strict policy, right, like, per semester about how much time these these players are allowed to miss and all these different sports whether it's basketball or baseball you know whatever football is different because it's once a week on Saturdays but all these right. other sports that are put the Olympic sports together, are yeah they have to they have to put their schedule together based on how many class days are you going to miss you know and and it, Notre Dame sends academic advisors on a lot of these trips and you know like a couple of weeks ago there was an academic advisor down there at the ACC tournament and all that kind of sure. stuff because of the, you know, they were the, there for a whole week and, and everything else. But that's, I just, I, I don't see. Right. I mean, I don't see state you jumping in on that one, right. you know, like they're just, I, they're, they're happy and, to cash their checks. And I like that at Notre Dame. I mean, I, again, one of the reasons that I like Notre Dame is because of the standards that they have, but you cannot expect everybody to follow those standards. It's, that's just not realistic. And they're trying to even the playing field with the way that they do things so that everybody does it the way they do it. And, and to use to use your analogy, Sean, of the South Bend raising the GPA level, the only way that would have been fair is if everybody else in the state raised it up right. to 2.0. Right. And, but, you know, Digger was like, you know, it needs to be this way, it needs to be that, but you're he changing one corporation. He thought that that was going to make kids work harder. No, they really only made more kids give uh, up because they were yes. struggling as it was. Because they know? knew they weren't going to reach that that point. And right. you know, you're lucky you had a kid that was high academics, and I have a kid who's high academics. It wouldn't have changed anything for us, but it changed a lot of things for a lot of kids who, for various reasons, were never going to meet that standard they just weren't and now you're on an uneven playing field right. with everybody else now Notre Dame has put themselves on an uneven playing field with everybody else but you just can't expect everybody to join you there right. you've done that because that's what you want to do and I like it's, that but it's that's just, just very high-minded to think yes that, you know and again at, at the very least you know they're again they're taking some shots from this they knew this wasn't going to be 100 percent 
received, you know, and again, it was going to be a very right. polarizing thing, but at the very least, They've done their job because now it's a national discussion. You've got people, you know, it was on the Today Show yesterday. Yeah. You've got, yeah. you know, again, like you've got national podcasts and radio shows and everybody else talking about Be it. So Because they, they have the people behind them, right? I mean, right. that's that's what does it. I mean, if, if Iowa State, you know, put this op-ed out there, number one, the New York Times wouldn't have picked it up. And <laughs> number two, nobody would be listening. So, I mean, I do feel like, you know, with great power comes a great responsibility, right? The whole Spider-Man quote. I think that kind of falls here. You're part of Notre Dame. Like, you have great power. You have a, a responsibility to put things out. I think they might have gone a little too far with some of it. I like it all. But, again, you can't expect everybody to jump on board. But the NIL piece, 100% well, needs you know, to happen. But there are, there are people, Notre Dame fans included, who – specific to the NIL piece that some of the, you know, some of their comments are you're, you're telling recruits that you don't, you know, that you're not in on NIL by saying this. which, which is totally not true, but Notre Dame does a very poor job of PRing public relationing or however you want to say it, what they do for NIL, because you make a lot of money in NIL they, with they Notre Dame. A complete hands off approach to it. Like I was, but, I was talking to, you know some of the some of the people connected to the team. I don't I don't want to be too specific with who I was talking to, but they they basically people who work for the team, not coaches and players. Obviously, they have to they have to be hands off when it comes to that NIL stuff. Basically, the NIL stuff is between the player and whoever they're getting the NIL from. Like for example, virtually every Notre Dame women's basketball player has an Under Armour NIL deal, which I had no clue about. So I guess hmm. like unless you're following them very closely, you know, there's probably some social media. I didn't know that either. I had I had no clue. So I'm going to assume that, you know, if, if they do, that probably means most of the men's basketball players do. And it probably means a good percentage of the football players do, if not all I, of them. I know there's something that every player on the Notre Dame football team gets. It's not a ton of money, but there's something that there's there's a there's a, a fixed amount that right. everybody on the football team gets. And I don't exactly know how that works, but then they also have like, you know, what was it over like Christmas break? They had a bunch of guys going to the food pantry and all of those different things. Those guys are all getting paid by NIL now. And it's pushed by the program, you know, but it's just kind of. You know, it's it's just not out right. there for public consumption. Again, that, that's part of the Brady Quinn fun thing. Like you can right. you can right. go do community service events and you'll get paid for it, which is great. But that also means that you know there's a lot of time involved in doing for that. sure. But things. again, I'm cool with that. Like, I, go earn your just like the three of us do. Like our paycheck, we earn it. Like, go I, earn. I don't your have a problem. Money. I don't have a problem with it, but. We know that it, you know, all we have to do is look at this, the, the 2023 football recruiting cycle and know that NIL had an impact 100%. on what Marcus Freeman, you know, on who Marcus Freeman was able to sign at the end of the day. No doubt. And they have to, in my opinion, you, you either, if they're not going to have any rules, then, you know, if Notre Dame wants to continue doing it the way they're doing it, that's fine. But then don't complain about other teams doing it the way they're doing it. You can't have it both ways. So if there's going to be rules, great. Everybody needs to follow those rules and Notre Dame probably be in good shape. The way they're doing it now, I still think there's things Notre Dame can do and still be on the high road with NIL and still not be giving blank checks to guys. Right. And, but you can, hey, you know, ex-alumni who owns this, hey, here's your spokesperson. Yeah, he's, you know, this, that, and the other, whatever. But they're still doing something to earn the money. I'm fine with that. I feel like there's more Notre Dame can do and still not be writing blank checks to kids like Texas A&M, for example. Jesse, do you have anything else before <laughs> we've been we... stopping? We've been stomping <laughs> all over you, Jess. No, I, I just uh, I appreciate that that Schwarberg has has at least started this conversation because it, I, I agree with what you guys are saying. Like more that you can't stand on moral high ground and just expect everyone to conform to what you believe. But I believe a lot of what Schwarberg was saying, and I appreciate the conversation starting about 
you know, at a, at a kind of a national level of, you know, what's actually going on comparatively, you know, I mean, there's guys who are literally just getting blank checks and that's mm-hmm. more or less what Schwarberg wanted to say without directly saying it. And I think another well, important piece in there that I really enjoyed was, you know, that the mention of that there should be a national medical trust fund started that benefit all student athletes. If you, you know, suffer a major injury while in college um, and another one that, you know, that there should be a policy that allow players who leave school to come back uh, after going pro to finish their degree when he started mentioning, referencing, you know, Jerome Bettis and those things. So I appreciate a lot of the conversations that Schwarberg has started um, and especially those last ones I talked about. because I think that's important of, you know, starting a fund for people who get hurt and, you know, tragically kind of end their career. And again, for, for allowing the option for guys to come back and, and finishing their degree, because again, that's the, the main point of the article is the, that Schwarberg wants to place the importance on education and not just money flowing in from wherever it comes right. from. Right. And again, I get that. But, um, you know, they they also are very dollar conscious, conscious you know. So, and, and just like everybody is dollar conscious. And when you have the second highest ticket prices of all college football programs, again, this is according to, to a report that just came out recently and you've got that massive endowment and you've got a, your own TV contract. It's just, it's, it's hard to get around those optics. And, and like from an NIL standpoint, I get, you don't just want to write the blank check, but if you have the money, how hard is it to tell a recruit, you know, like when, when these other schools are obviously handing out, their own, you know, the, their own blank checks, pay for play or, you know, whatever you want to call it. How hard is it to say, you know, you're going to be the Joe's barbecue, you know, sponsor for the next two years for, for whatever this NIL deal, you know, and obviously I'm just making that up, but it, it seems like there are ways to get creative and, 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 and not just in a, you know, again, because as Swarbrick says, you've got to prove that a service was performed. So, I mean, he's, he's the endorser of product X for the first you know, however, however long that you want to write it up. Like, how hard is it for for Notre Dame to do something like that to to get more more proactive with the NIL and not just be writing a blank check for for no services performed? See, I would go a different route with all the money that Notre Dame never wants to spend. I would upgrade the amenities for the athletes to like the nth degree. You and, know what I mean? Hey, we're we're not in the business of cutting checks. You'll get a you know some good money from the NIL, but you also will have some of the top right uh, facilities, training tables, you know, right. meals, all, basically what you're saying. To that's to what I would bridge do. Bridge that gap. Yeah, because that because right now you know there, there's a lot of things to like about Notre Dame. I mean, when you come on campus and you go for a visit, but there's a lot of things that need to be upgraded. And I, and I know that they, they have the whole, we have to have all the money in place and blah, 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 blah. You got a couple billion dollars sitting right over there. There's money in place. That's what I'm saying. Use that and just trick out the locker room, the and training facility, like all of it. Just, the fact that they do have the money in place just makes it fall on deaf ears. To, sure. You know, right. The rest of the, the college world at large. Yeah. That's, Right, and that's the thing. Everyone like, Notre Dame has the money, but sure, I, I always wouldn't. I wouldn't use it for NIL. I would use it for to the benefit. The rich guy of stays everybody. rich because he doesn't want to spend the money. Sure, you know, Scrooge McDuck, man, he's that's swimming right. around in his gold. And he ain't spending any of it. That's exactly right. You know, <laughs> same thing. All right, well, let's move on a little bit <laughs> since this is supposed to be rapid fire. I mean, I we knew it was going to be a big topic, and we'd spend some time on it, but. Fill in the blank. Notre Dame held its NFL Pro Day today for draft-eligible players, and it's blank that Michael Mayer did not run the 40. Uh, It's not a good look that Michael Mayer didn't run the 40 because it's the biggest question and concern coming out of the combine, and I believe it's just not – you're basically saying you don't trust yourself to improve your time and you don't want to make yourself look any worse. So I I get it on both ends because, like I said, you don't want to run it – you don't want to run slower and, you know, basically create – more questions about your speed. Um, but at the same time, I, I think that that should have been something that he just worked that like he should have been running forties every day since the combine and just come out and run something under four, seven, in my opinion. So an interesting tweet from Sean Crawford this afternoon. Mm. I don't know if you saw it. And I, I know Vince was 
No. As he said, very busy. But <laughs> Sean Crawford tweeted that the turf at the Irish Athletic Center, where they have done the last few pro days, including today, he said the turf there is very soft and slow. Hmm. Crawford said it's a good practice turf, but not good to run a 40 time. He said they tried to have it moved to the loftest for his pro day when they did. Huh. So like, how big a factor was that? I mean, that makes but sense because... You know, not I'm not critiquing any 40 time here because it's faster than anything I could ever run. Right. Um, and <laughs> it's still it's still quick. But, you know, when we had Bracey on the other day, he he said that he could sit in the four fours and potentially down into the four three. And he only ran a four five four today. Again, that's fast. And I, I don't mean it only <laughs> when I say, you know, four five four. But obviously his expectations were a lot different. And, and when you say that, you know, Crawford brings that up. It, it kind of aligns with it because I guarantee out in California, Bracey was sitting in the four fours. And then to come out today and run a four five four, four I, five, I just yeah. think, I think that that logically makes sense. And so if that's, if that run has the thing so on concrete, you know, that's a fast <laughs> surface. Well, and look, here, here's the thing, Sean, you and I have both walked on both surfaces that they have at the practice facility. They have the indoor practice facility, which is pretty much brand new. And you know how those, those kind of turf, that turf is it's bouncy. It's soft which is right. perfect for practice, like he said. When you go outside, it's a little harder because it's been there for a little bit longer. You can dig into it. I feel like I feel like you they've they moved just moved it outside. Just moved it to one of the outside fields. I feel like it would have gone a lot faster. And the what weather was, was fine today. I was I gonna say, was, what was the temperature today? I, I mean, yeah. it was like high forties. It's like forty eight degrees right now. I mean, like it's like you know, you, you know, guys outside? are concerned about tweaking the hamstrings and all that I guess. kind of stuff. I don't know. Vince, I get. Not on I get what you're route. saying. What 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 do you think? Like I thought that he would run to try to improve. I did too. The forty time. I just don't think it it's sends one, the right message overall. I guess is what it's I'm one of two things. Say. Either he's really confident about where he's going to go. He's gotten feedback from teams that he's going to go in a certain place, and he's, he's fine he's with that. To all thirty two. And if that's the case, and and he knows where he's going to go, or he thinks he knows where he's going to go, and he's cool with that, maybe he doesn't. Maybe he's afraid he's going to run even slower. And he's like, right. well, this this is the one I've got in the bag. I know that I'm going to go top 20. I'm cool with that. Then so, you know, that's how I feel it that's went. That's got to be it, in my opinion, because yeah. why not prove prove it wrong and, and right. go after the one thing that everyone's criticizing you about? Right, right. exactly. But, you know, in fact, he, he still ran a very solid three-cone drill. Uh, right. I think it was like 6.97 or something like that. And the Notre Dame football account tweeted – that would been would have been the third best out of all of the tight ends at this combine this year. So, you know, maybe that that's what he felt good about. And to me, the three cone drill for someone like Michael Mayer is more important because you're showing you're getting in and out of cuts and you can move in and out of cuts and have the explosiveness. So maybe that was another factor. He felt good about where his three cone drill was sitting at after, you know, the day. And and he he proved during the combine that he's got good hands. So I mean, you know, I, I think he proved enough. But like I said, if he was getting a bunch of negative feedback, I bet he would have run today. Yeah. Sam Hartman throwing him the football today. Did you see that? Was Sam he really? No, his, Sam Hartman and his leg tattoo were out there. I saw that. Yeah. The, I didn't. What did you guys – have you guys seen any of the pic? I don't like um, – for, for workout gear, I don't like all white. And especially for someone <laughs> well, like had, Michael like, the, Mayer. A lot of them had the floppy shorts. Yeah, like Mayer had the floppy shorts on instead yeah. of like, you know, like the tighter. The compression. Know. But again, yeah. I just feel like all white gear, especially on someone kind of pale like Michael Mayer, isn't the most. <laughs> it's not the thing that like makes you the, the look the most athletic, I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> You're just using your own your own biases. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I like it on uniforms, though. But just like the the all compression gear, I just felt like it was not wasn't that good of a look. And um, I, another thing that stood out to me in the, the Notre Dame's um, pro day today was after, you know, talking to, to Tariq Bracey the other day, he talked about, you know, how his vertical and broad jumpers, you know, stuff that he felt good about. And, and both of them, he, he performed really well, especially in the vertical it was a 38 and a half yeah. uh, vertical. And he had the broad fastest 40 good. today yeah. out of all the guys that ran for Notre Dame. So I feel like overall he, he put together a really, Solid performance, and that that I think to did. me that feels good too. Feels good because I think it, it, it he was it was something that he was very concerned about, and again gave him a, a really good opportunity to kind of continue you know his his path. Avery Davis had a nice forty time, four five six for a guy that's who's great. Blown out both knees, over coming the off the injury and everything. That's yeah. awesome. I'm I'm ecstatic for him, no yeah. doubt. 
Jafar Armstrong was there today. It always kind of, you know, like, <laughs> oh, yeah, Jafar. It's like eh, he they came invited back him back. He, yeah, they let him do his pro day. Jafar had a 4.65 was his best time. Well, and it's interesting because he didn't have anything to do with Marcus Freeman, did he? He's been gone for a couple of years. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, he has that's interesting. Yep. Very interesting. Vince, could you throw up uh 225 for 37? Like <laughs> not even Smith? once. Not even one time. It would crush me like a like a bug. <laughs> Mayor Mayor put up like 21. Bo Bauer put up 30. Um, you know, back in my day, I I got real close to 20. That was did you? I, I Look at you. You might see, but you're, you're a middle linebacker. You should be able to just pump that out. <laughs> yeah. Come on now. Yeah. Broad that's... jest. <laughs> that's right. I've got pictures of you. I can throw them up for the folks. That's right. <laughs> All right. So Marcus Freeman, day one of football practice the other day, wore a hoodie. Oh, sweet. That yeah, it was. It's like a lot of people liked the hoodie. Wore it to practice. Wore it to the post practice press conference. It's not available anywhere for the public to buy and this is not the first time this has happened with marcus mm -hmm. freeman and the apparel like what what is going on here like if it seems like you know marcus freeman is a walking billboard you you think that you would have whatever he's going to wear when he you know he's going to be in public like that would be in stock and ready to go because people want it and they're not able to get it dude has serious swag okay like we've talked about the green hat with the blue shamrock I don't know if that's available anywhere, but that's a sweet hat. The shirt that he was wearing, uh, because everybody was wearing green at the women's game, he had a T-shirt on over his white hoodie, right. which was friggin' awesome. It was a green shirt with a yellow football and the and the and the the leprechaun in the middle of the football, and I think that's the same kind of logo that was on the hoodie. Like friggin' awesome, sweet. Yeah. I would buy this stuff, and I'm a penny pincher. Okay. I think his stuff I is that. awesome. He, I mean, it's not wrong, right? <laughs> his stuff is sweet. I love his style and what he – they would make so much money if they would have the Marcus Freeman collection. Just And have it ready to go. That's yeah, right. that's, a, it's, that's a good point you bring up, Vince. Like the Marcus Freeman line or the Marcus Freeman gear – and he just models all of it because, you know, I don't even know what sweatshirt you guys are talking about. I haven't seen it. Um, I don't – I'm assuming it's sweet because, like Ben said, usually everything that he wears is pretty cool. And I feel like it's set up that way. Like he's definitely, uh, you know, ha has stuff that he only – like he gets it, gets to wear it first. And then, you know, maybe if, if we're all lucky, it drops in the store. But I feel like he has his own, like, collection of stuff that only he has. And it's like – it makes you very jealous as a fan, especially – like I'm a big gear guy. I love hats. I love sweatshirts. I love, you know, the t-shirts, whatever it might be. So anytime I see that stuff and there's been times where I'm like, I, I want that. And I go scouring through the bookstore and I literally cannot find it anywhere. I mean, that's literally, you know, like the NFL, they crank out new apparel every year. And it's why coaches aren't allowed to wear a shirt and tie on the sideline anymore because, oh, there, there it is. Go. Because they want them selling, they want them being billboards and selling apparel for them. I mean, you know, this is, I look, I love the white, right? That's kind of my thing these days. Like, that is an awesome looking sweatshirt. Like, it's awesome. I would not wear the white, just, you know, like, <laughs> Vince has confidence to wear that white, man. Dude. Shoulders are a little wider than yours, you know, like the whole <laughs> thing. And then there's the whole like fact that I'm a slob when I eat and I just, I stopped wearing white shirts because i can't keep true it off. I, I can't keep I, I food like off the front of my shirt you go every meal you eat there's always a little bit of something that ends up on your <laughs> that's exactly right <laughs> that is exactly right and it's not even like you're just devouring your food or being an animal about it it's just, it just like happens. a little piece just falls out and it's always something i always look and i'm like well there it is again <laughs> there it goes <laughs> there it is it didn't take long <laughs> well here's the other one this is the one Let's see if I can do this. This is the one that, uh, I, oh man, I don't even know if I can figure it out. Let me see here. I had it. I had it all figured out before. Google Chrome is that going to work? No, nope, that's not going to work. All right, well I'll figure it out later. But the all green right. one, the green one was awesome. Like I, I really dug yes. the green one that he was wearing at the at the women's the basketball green. game. Down yeah, that was green. awesome. All right, so. Notre Dame announced Micah Shrewsbury as the new men's basketball coach Love that. today after paying a record $4 million buyout <laughs> to Penn State. So 
What role do you think the whole Andy Ludwig fiasco played in this? And does I, this end the narrative that Notre Dame won't shell out the money for a good coach? I think that the Andy Ludwig situation forced Jack Schwarbrick to, to play his cards in this situation. I'm going to die by it because there's not a chance <laughs> that a t- that a, the second article comes out about Jack Schwarbrick in a month saying that he wouldn't buy another buyout after he, yeah. after he put a whole now, long email out saying it that, is it is a head coach versus an assistant coach. I get that. that. That is a good point. But football is your money maker compared to football to basketball. is the money maker. I think it has as much maybe that had something to do with it, but I I also think it has as much to do with the fact that Jack Swarbrick wanted this guy, he didn't want the other guy. Oh yeah, that, I, I, yo, I definitely yeah. think so. But Jack again, Swarbrick just, really wanted Micah Shrewsbury. I think. I just, yes, he did. Just imagine the headline good. of Micah Shrewsbury staying at Penn State, Notre Dame not buying out contract for the second time after Schwarberg went on this big spiel about how it was never about the buyout, it was never about the money, blah 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 blah. There's no way he could die on that sword twice. There's just That's absolutely true. no way. It would have been a PR nightmare. I mean, there's yeah. no. There's no two ways about it. If the it reports would been, got yeah. out that it was that it came down to to buyouts, that's exactly right. I, right, I do agree with that. But it would have been a PR nightmare. Talking yeah. about Shrewsbury itself, I'm really happy that they did make the move, and I feel like there is, you know, to me this this displays some sort of commitment that even though Bray is leaving and the legacy left and all the seasons he left here, that they want to take a, a next step. And Shrewsbury did a really good job. At Penn State, he's an Indiana guy by nature, and I, I, I think the fit is good. And I think that overall, it, it sends a message that they don't want to take a back seat in terms of men's basketball anymore. Step one in the roster rebuild is right in Shrewsbury's living room. Yes, apparently his four-star son Braden is coming with him. Yeah. So that yeah. is that's a start. And, and there's he's another been a three-star kid. guy that's he's teetered back and forth be, between being a three-star and a four-star guy, depending on where you look. And there's a there's another Indiana kid who is committed to Penn State who is also going to be I believe on campus this weekend okay uh, um, to check things out so plus you got Marcus Burton coming in really yes, good sir. chance he's going to be Mr Basketball in Indiana mm-hmm. yeah. maybe what, yep. is, what do you so think if you were handicapping excited. that if you were handicapping that Vince because I mean like Northern From guys a, yeah that's the know, problem it's tough. so. I was actually in the athletic office this afternoon um, doing some stuff, and we were talking about that. And everybody's pretty confident that he's going to win it, but everybody's also – it's just like that elephant in the room of the non-Indianapolis guy because a non-Indianapolis yeah. guy, yeah, like a northern – That's where yeah. all the media – all the media is down right. there, and they fall in love with those guys. It's, the, the best part that Marcus has going for him is that he leads the state in almost every category. Well, like, and, and being at Penn also helps too. Because if you're going to be up here and be in true. an area of South Bend, I feel like being at Penn gives you the biggest chance. Because well, and he went – You they, can be at a state level in various sports. Like Penn is known within the state compared to other schools in the north. Well, and they went to the final four, you know, I mean, they, they, they went deep into the playoffs and he was, he starred in those playoff games, you know what I mean? So that was very helpful. So he got a lot of exposure, you know, doing that. And so I I think he's going to win it. I think everybody's pretty confident he's going to win it, but when he doesn't, I think people are going to be real hot up here. It's going to be very interesting. By the way, did you see uh, the Ted Lasso reference in the video they put out on Shrewsbury? They showed no. the they showed the play like a champion sign, and then they panned down, and there was a another sign taped up that said "Believe." You I know, did like not above the, the awesome. believe above the the Ted Lasso doorway. I did. I yep. have not watched the the second episode yet this week. Well, I haven't seen that. I, I've only seen episode one Same. so far. So, and a, a apparently, Michael Shrewsbury has a current freshman as well, a uh, high school kid who's pretty stinking good. And that's the other thing I think that's really reassuring about Shrewsbury is the roster was going to be in a bad spot. Mm -hmm. And with, you know, and it, it, to me, it, it makes me feel better that there's already people saying they're going to come with him. Well, and in the, in just the attention that he's going to bring on a a depleted roster. Yeah. I mean, as far as a splash, he's the biggest splash that Notre Dame could have made in all this. And in terms of guys who are going to, it's because it's not like, you know, when, when Notre Dame hired Mike Bray, from Delaware, you know, they, that he walked in and, and guys are like, Ooh, Mike Bray, I've got to go to Notre Dame to play for Mike Bray. You know, like once, sure. once the guard friendly system 
was established, then I think that that attracted some certain guys. But I, I think in terms of walking right in the door, there's there's a lot more cachet with Shrewsbury than than there would have been oh. for the other reported candidates. Honestly, too, this makes yeah. me the most excited about men's basketball that I've probably been since those elite eight appearances. Well, and there's that too, because like even you know whatever the roster turns out being, then. It seems like this guy might sell you some tickets next year. I mean, because they're not going to get a ton of wins. I just can't imagine that they are, especially if they're loaded up with a bunch of freshmen and grad transfers. I mean, they might, you know, shock a team here or there. I think the overall resume is going to be tough, right? I so think they're going to play that. hard, though, because they, Penn State well, started out in the dump this year, and they end up going on a run to end their season and make the tournament. I'm not saying that that's defense, necessarily baby. what's going to happen. But I, I still think that they will play hard, and I still think on top of that and the excitement that it will draw a lot of people in. If he can preach some defense and you see these guys, you know, bringing their lunch pail, you know, every game, it'll be an easy team to root for, right? Yeah. And, and you know, get those fans in on the ground floor and get them excited. And if you can see progress every year, then that'll be great. You know what I mean? Don't expect miracles in year one or two, but if you can see legit progress, you see them playing hard, you see him – just nailing the recruiting trail. You know, I want I want to see social media. I want to see him at recruits' houses. I want to see him getting on the plane. I want to, you know, not just going to the other side of town and watching a basketball <laughs> game. Like, let's see, let's see him doing his thing, and that'll be great. So you're saying scale. that Notre Dame social media needs to follow him in July when he's going to all the recruiting well, events in the tournament. Remember what they did with Marcus Freeman when he first got the job? Like they sent a film crew with him. And they, like, documented the whole trip. Like, Do it. that's what I want to see. Do it. Yeah, I agree. So Notre Dame women's basketball, of course, is in the Sweet 16. They played Maryland Saturday morning. Do you guys buy or sell this season as a success if they don't beat Maryland? Uh, I, I would buy it as a success purely because – you know, what you're saying is you're a top 16 team in the country, and I don't think that that was – Notre Dame's entire goal this season. Obviously, they had, you know, Elite Eight, Final Four, National Championship, you know, goals, mindset, and those sort of things. But, and this isn't to make excuses, but when you lose your best player, who is the best, you know, distributor of the ball, is just your point guard, you know, the overall general of the floor, and you lose someone like her and you still can go on and win some games. I still think that it, it still can be a successful season. And I'm 50-50 on if they lose to Maryland, if it could, you know, what what's the public's view going to be? Um, but I still see it as an overall success considering, you know, what they've had to go through over the last month and the recalibrating. Um, and, and, you know, that Mississippi State game wasn't an easy game. And they really had to fight, uh, you know, hard to get down to the Sweet 16 in order to win that game. So I thought that they proved a lot in that game. Not proved a lot, showed a lot of mm -hmm. toughness in that Mississippi State game because they easily could have folded, you know, when things kind of got close there towards the end. I, like, it to be in the middle of the season, it was Final Four bust for me. Like, with right. the way the team was put together, the way they were playing, like, they, it was Final Four bust. Uh, now, when with Mabry and Miles being out, I think – Sweet 16, that is the level of success. If they would have lost to Mississippi State, I think there would have been some like, man, we did not take care of business on our home right. floor. There would have been then disappointment. It's a different I think, story yeah. if they lose last week. For yes, them. I 100% floor, agree. Yep. Double digit seed and all that stuff. Absolutely. I think that would have been disappointing and that would have been a tough way to end the year. I think right now it's a success. If they can go out there and compete with Maryland and do their thing, maybe even pull off the upset, because I think it would be an upset. I, I don't. Look, Notre Dame's the three. I get it, but it's. I think it would be an upset. Then it basically right now they're they're playing with house money. That that's how I feel about it. And you can ride a Sweet Sixteen momentum into the off season with the way things ended from an injury standpoint. And look, injuries are injuries. This is something that you can't prevent. It's not an excuse, but it's a fact. Like you lost your senior leader and you lost your best player. Like that's really hard to overcome, and they still made it to the Sweet Sixteen. I think that's if, a success. If Neil can win this game, I think it shows 
a level of coaching excellence on her terms, on her, right. on her end. Because then you're overachieving to it. You're overachieving. Yes. Even, though the, you're first, creating even though the first game, game was an even matchup, but now, you know, now you're down Olivia Miles. They've got the same team. Here's what I'm wondering tomorrow. Like, how much difference will, like, even though you're without Olivia Miles, getting Kassan Prosper, who they didn't have the first time these that they played. They got her about a month later because what... Okay. What Maryland, and I know you guys haven't looked specifically at the matchup, but what Maryland was able to do in that first game was use their long athletes and really took advantage of those long athletes um, against Notre Dame. And so at least having Kassan Prosper can potentially help neutralize yeah. some that of that. She's got it. They have to be very active defensively. That That needs to be a large right. emphasis on their game plan is – what are they going to do defensively to kind of, you know, ne not negate, but bridge that gap offensively without Olivia Miles? Well, right. defense and rebounding. I mean, they 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 figured out the rebounding piece, obviously, in the Mississippi State game. They were rebounding crazy, which was awesome. <laughs> I mean, two girls almost had 20 rebounds, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. I mean, <laughs> that's 33 between West Belt and yeah. Dillo. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they need to continue that, right? They need to keep playing lockdown defense. The only thing they need to do a little bit better than the Mississippi State game is hit some shots. I mean, they just yeah, I mean, they were very cold from the field. They, they, they did yeah. not shoot well. The three ball was not going down well. That was that was very, you know, that was very Mississippi State game plan. Sure. It was specific. pointed. Yeah, going absolutely. Going back to the using their athletes and going back to the to the Louisville connection that their head coach had. It, and to answer the question, I absolutely think that it is it is a success no matter what yeah. happens tomorrow. No, I mean you know, it, any team that doesn't end up winning their last game, there's disappointment of course. in that last game if you lose. But at the same time, everything they've gone through, and, it, you know, like like everyone talks about Olivia Miles, but I do think that you – I think Vince – I think you guys both mentioned Dara Mabry, but, she, you know, that's a big factor as well when you're missing a three-point shooter, yeah. your veteran, fifth-year leader, and all that kind of stuff. And I know, you know, there's a lot of people, well, you know, that, that like to talk about – you know, Mabry's liabilities, but the leadership is big. The three point shooting is big. And when Neil Ivy came in with the roster that she had coming into this whole situation, getting Dara Mabry, you know, a player with that experience and the three point shooting, that is that, that has benefited them much more than, you know, any any negatives that you want sure. to talk about over the last three years. And that was that was a big loss for them. So to lose mm -hmm. those two, three, I think no matter what. Tomorrow is a success, and I, I think I think they have really good. Tomorrow. I'll be curious to see kind of what Maryland throws at them again. Again, they've got a couple, you know, tall players, tall, you know, long, tall athletes in uh, Shan Sellers and Diamond Miller, and and uh, Miller, like Olivia Miles and Sonia Citron, is an All American. She averages almost twenty points per game, and you know she's the one who hit the game winning shot and scored thirty one against them the yeah. first time at Purcell. That so. game's at 11.30, right? A.M.? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Well, Notre Dame football practice is at 10.30, so I'm hoping to get home in time to uh, catch the tip off. That's the goal. <laughs> All right. So. I, have a, I have another basketball question I wanted to throw out to you guys. While All we're right. Still, while we're still on <laughs> basketball. I, I just I saw this right before the show. I thought it was interesting, so I'm going to oh, pose boy. a question. I want, I want everyone's uh, – feedback i'm gonna try to you know i haven't written the question out but I, I have it in my head so it's blank that last night when michigan state lost it marks the 138th consecutive ncaa tournament bids without a national championship coming from the big 10 conference this season the big 10 had eight teams in the in the tournament zero made it to the elite eight and one team made it to the sweet 16. I want I want thoughts on that. I mean, Big Ten's it, overrated. It's just more Big Ten overrated, <laughs> you know. That's what it that, is. I hope that doesn't mean you know, like the 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 coach that we just talked about who's coming in here, like that. You know, <laughs> it's is any shade on him? It's not any shade on him, but I, you know, I hope that that, you know, I just couldn't I, believe I know, that a but, Big Ten team has never. But I mean, made the fact that Michigan State was the last championship. Big Ten team anyway. It's like that's the team that you know everyone expected the least from. And they almost made yeah. it to the Elite Eight because they've got Tim is Tom Izzo 
and you don't. You know, that's what it comes down to. So, what what was the stat about Big Ten ch- national championships? Never, yeah, that question on. was very long. It's basically the Big Ten's last national championship was, was Michigan, Michigan State. State. Yeah. What what, yeah, they, what was that? Was that two thousand or nineteen ninety nine? I think it was two thousand. Oh, was it wasn't that it? long ago? Yeah. Yeesh. Yep. All right. Do you guys really want to get into this baseball question, or do you want to save it for next week? Uh, I'm good with either one because, I mean, I love Jesse. It. It's on you. <laughs> yeah, just let it fire. All right. All right. World Baseball Classic, of course, ended this week, and it's you know been a pretty polarizing topic for baseball fans. Major League Baseball thinks the WBC is going to help grow its game, and you know they're talking about the next step, getting more elite pitchers from the U.S. involved in the World Baseball Classic, and we're all baseball fans. So where do you guys stand on this? Look, that, that's what they were missing. They were missing some elite pitchers. If they had an elite pitcher, they would have won the, the World Baseball Classic. That offensive lineup was unbelievable, and Japan just neutralized them by bringing in a bunch of pitchers that those guys have never seen. And it it proved to pay dividends. I mean, it was still a one-run game, but, I mean, that was an awesome game from start to finish to watch. I loved it. I loved a little high-stakes baseball in March. I think it was very well-received by the fans that were there. I think it was – I think I saw a stat that 96% of the TVs but, in Japan were watching the game. But do you think it's going to actually help grow Major League Baseball? I do because I think it classic. takes it to a national stage and it, it allows – like when Japan can win and when Puerto Rico can win and when Venezuela can win, I think it allows and it gives the opportunity for other countries to realize that they too can, you know, get into the MLB essentially, that they can – it, it, and it's a, I think it's allowing the MLB game to also kind of reach different areas um, of the world. And like like Vince said, I, I loved the game and I love seeing Shohei Otani and Mike Trout at the end of the game in the final at bat of the game. Uh, you know, two of the best one, probably, you know, the best hitter in the league right now and, and considering one of the best pitchers uh, in the league right now. And, and like Vince said, too, I think that the you know, the. The United States lacked some some depth pitching and some of their overall you know caliber guys, um, but I get it because you don't want a guy to blow out his elbow, you know, and basically in spring training, and that, and it goes back to kind of a conversation that we had earlier this week. When is the best time to place the WBC? And I think that's more of the issue rather than is the WBC good for the game because I do think it's good for the game, and I, I, for what I just mentioned, I think it allows other countries you know to to get some of that national stage. Um, and give opportunity. I mean, like like I said a couple of weeks ago too. There was a 21 year old, you know, from Nicaragua that struck out three MLB guys back to back to back and ended up getting a contract right after the game. So <laughs> I think that alone shows that the WBC is great for the MLB because it just gives people the opportunity. I don't know. You know, they've they played the World Baseball Classic before. It's not like Major League Baseball has had a massive spike in popularity as a result. I mean, these are great games. Like Chris Russo. On ESPN, you know, said he wasn't into it. And so, you know, he's got Dallas Braden, AJ Pruszynski, and Marcus Stroman, you know, all coming at him saying he shouldn't be working there, you know, if that's his attitude and all this kind of stuff. It's like, give me a break, man. You know, it's like we're entitled to our opinions. He's entitled to his sure. opinion. He's not in it as much. And I, I, I think it's a really cool event. I just don't know that it really translates into helping Major League Baseball become more popular. I hope it becomes more popular and worldwide. Like, the guys are going to see, oh, well, where are these guys playing at? Oh, they're playing in the Major Leagues? I'm going to tune into some of those games if I can, you know, if they can get them. I mean, I don't even know. I can't even watch Cubs games. So, you know, (laughs) they probably can't watch them in Nicaragua and Mexico and everywhere else either. But uh, I hope that it starts to grow the game a little bit more internationally. I think that would be great. Because there's a lot of great international players in Major League Baseball. By the way, on this date, March 24th, 1984, a brain, an athlete, a basket case, a princess, and a criminal spent their Saturday in detention in a Chicago suburban high oh my school. Goodness. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Yes. Yes. Jesse, what am I talking about? 
I know the movie. I want to make sure that I get it right. <laughs> you know uh, the movie, but you don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's The Breakfast Club. There you go. Oh, well that's some quick Googling nice. by you, buddy. I just had yeah. to Google to make sure that it, that's what the name of it was. I Googled Breakfast <laughs> Club, saw the, the movie, you know, the, the movie cover, and I was like, yep, that's the one. That's exactly the one I'm thinking of. I, th I saw the tweet this afternoon, and I had to get that in there at the end. <laughs> That, and you know, it's just add it to the list of things that make me feel old because I would have been a sophomore in high school at that point. You're telling me that me turning 27 <laughs> last week didn't make you feel old? Yeah. Well, knowing that you're the same age as the uh, women's basketball sports information director, that, you know, Ooh. definitely adds to it as well. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to end it on that. We will be back, of course, Monday. A little uh, Jared Parker offensive coordinator talk coming up tomorrow after practice. Hopefully <clears throat> somebody gets me some of that audio so we can use it on Monday's show. <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise, guys, enjoyed it. Have a great weekend. You too. Go Irish and tomorrow. Have a great call tomorrow. Looking forward to it. All right, will do. We'll talk to you then on Ivy Nation Sports Talk.